Hello guys. <coughs> Let's wait five minutes more till the rest of the people start and come. Okay. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay.
Okay, so, oh my God, my hair. Uh, so let's start today. Uh, let's, well, I'm ready, 10 minutes courtesy. This meeting is being recorded. Good morning, everybody. So today we're gonna have a little lecture on like how to use RhinoCam, well, Rhino, sorry, not RhinoCam, Rhino and Fusion that will be later at 11.30 with Joseph that is just here. You don't see in the camera. Uh, you can see in the other camera. Um, I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Mm -hmm. Okay. And first, do you have any questions regarding this weekly assignment? I name, I float, give you a panel. So just in case, uh, this week assignment, let's go over it and check what you need to do. So let's go, Ooh, it's content, assessment. Yesterday I sent you by email what we have to do. But the point of this week is to try and test some like 2D and 3D softwares and that you explain a little bit also what is the difference between what do you understand what is the difference between a raster a vector file and the different types of modeling ideally this week you should kind of try to model your final project it doesn't have to be the final end model but let's say a mock-up or sometimes a lot of people like for example they do, do want to do an aquaponic system that is a cylinder so they model kind of the cylinder, they try to put some materials and do a render or an animation. So the point of this week is to try different softwares, 2D and 3D. You need to like make the difference between both. And document it, it means take screenshots of the process. It's not a tutorial on how to use the software, but it's like, uh, like you need to, Tell the history of how you discover the software, <laughs> if you want to be a little bit more poetic, or like what you understand of the software and what do you think is good and bad points of maybe the two different softwares that you try. For example, this week, if you already know how to 3D model, that could be that could happen really easily. Don't stay with your like uh, habitual software. Like if you know how to use SolidWorks. Try, for example, Fusion, that is an alternative to SolidWorks. It's similar in the way it works, and you can try other software. So it's about exploration. If you already know the, some softwares, try other ones that you have never tried, at least for the sake of trying. So it's to expand, actually, your capabilities. If you already know how to use most of the 3D softwares, traditional 3D modeling softwares, like, for example, Fusion, Rhino, SolidWorks, Cinema, you already know, OK, try OpenSCAD, for example. OpenSCAD is really, really different. That is you OpenSCAD is open source and actually you don't draw. What you do is you code actually the geometries. Is we call it, uh, but the program is only 3D CAD modeler. If so, if you are like experienced programmer, you, feel, you will feel really comfortable with this software. And if not, it could be challenging even just to do a sphere. Um, just for the sake of showing you examples of, for example, other year students, this is TUES, last year page, uh, computer design. Uh, TUES, as far as I remember, is she's a programmer. Yes, yes she's, a, she's a programmer. And, and she already knows how to 3D model. She does expert in 3D modeling, but she knows a little bit of how 3D modeling works. So first she went into Illustrator and she made a little, some drawings and tried to make, for example, the same drawing in Photoshop and Illustrator to really understand what each different software is better for. And she explained like the, she explained her personal choice to actually explain the different types of formats, uh, for example, for compressing, then she jump onto 3D design and test, for example, OpenSCAD. She never tried and tried to model this Lego brick. Uh, also, for example, she tried Sketchfab to upload some 3D models and embed them into the, her web page. 
So for example, I think he did this in OpenSketch too. And she stated, for example, a few different commands that she was using most of the time. And she, the most important part is, for example, she, she has a little conclusion on each different software. Like it's just like one, two, three lines. Or, okay, I hate this software. I find it so difficult to use, like so completely unnatural. Or for the opposite, I love it. It's also, for example, here we have Fusion. In this case, I think this is her video? Or oh, it's not her video? Ah, yes, her video. For example, a lot of students, they usually follow up some like video tutorials they find on YouTube. It's nice that you actually put them as reference on your webpage, like embed the YouTube video that you use, or at least link the video that you use as reference. Or if you follow up a nice tutorial that you find somewhere, just put the link on your webpage. There is no shame. Like there is actually, that's the beauty of internet. Like we have tons of information. If you find one that is really good, a good curated and you find useful to develop your assignment, just also reference. And also she tried a little bit of Rhino and Discover actually. And Blender. She tried, actually Tue was, is really working person. So she tried a lot of software, she tried. Uh, for example, on the other hand, Antoine is a less, less talkative person. So also it represented on his webpage. It doesn't explain as much, but for example, she explained, he explained how to install GIMP into his Linux by terminal. He explained what he did with his screenshot. Always ref upload your files. If you have a, made an illustrator, upload the illustrator file. In case of this week that you will have like a lot of different servers, try to export into a, a international sharing file. That means, for example, Illustrator is a proprietary software uh, format. But if you save SVG for EPS, most of the softwares will open it on compared to AI format. Uh, happen the same with Photoshop. PSD format, Photoshop opens Photoshop formats, but GIMP has problems with it. So upload it in TIFF, that is a similar format, but most of the software is open. For 3D models, um, yesterday we talked about STEP, is an international sharing file format in case of NURBS and STL or OBJ for meshes. The point that the ones that evaluate you, like the global evaluator, is able to open your files. That is something that is commonly done. Like, for example, when I'm waiting, I always like automatically download all the repo and start to open all the files with all the programs. And check that everything is okay. Or just by curiosity, because we want to know how you did it and what you did. It's like sometimes really good and it's really interesting. Um, Inkscape, she, he did the same with Inkscape. In this case, uh, Antoine only went for open source software. Um, open SCAD again, and for example, he instead of uploading the file in Open SCAD, he just posted the code on how he did the 3D model uh, and FreeCAD and Blender. And I think that's it. And a little conclusion on how he did it. Uh, is that clear? Yes. Okay, let's start closing a few tabs. Um, is compulsory to do parametric design this week? Um, no, it's not mandatory. But next week, it will be mandatory that your laser cut press fit design is parametric. So, as much as you can save a little bit of time. Um, so, for example, next week, your time, more or less. Like this is the simplest assignment that you could do. That is basically design a parametric. Is glued? Oh, no. It's just old. Uh, for example, is design for example a piece, this kind of cookie with notches, so you can make press fit kits. This is a press fit. Is like you basically connect them by pressure, and they hold. You don't need to glue, neither screws, near anything like that. So. 
called geometric parametric. So you are able not only to change, for example, the design, but also the size of the notches, because you will need to adapt. Ideally, we will start over with cardboard because it's really forgiving, but then you will be able to do it also in acryl. Acryl, if you don't do it well, either it cracks or it doesn't fit. There is no other option. So that's the point to make it parametric. So you are able to change easily, really easily the design. It could be as easy as this like cookie, I don't know, maze game, or you can make uh, lamps, like really complicated lamps. Um, one of the points of being parametric is the model should be assembled in at least two different ways. This could be assembled in like millions of ways. It totally depends on the amount, number of pieces that you made. But for example, um, if you make a cylinder, the flat surface, like develop a surface of a cylinder, and the tops, that should could only be assembled in one way. But if, for example, if in, I don't know, the top, you make a different notch, you can connect and make the tops of the cylinder connect like this. Could be an open cylinder, etc. So it could be a, like a transformative shape. Uh, that is like not the first point of the assignment. The first point is to understand what is, how to do press fit, how to do curves, and how to use the laser cut. So it should be parametric. So as much as you can save this week a little bit of time by already designing something, or no big, no big deal. Okay, so let's start with the proper Rhino. I will hide this blue screen, hide floating meeting controls. Okay, much better, no? Okay, so when you open up Rhino, have you ever used Rhino? Someone here? Okay, a few. Okay, that's that's good. No, no at all. Yes, yes, yeah, go on. Tenemos en el otro en el portátil tenemos también Rhino. Yes. You said just one because we have two laptops that are not really awesome, but we have some software already installed. But yes, you can use this one. In that case, we need to split the screen. People will not see what you're doing on the screen. Uh, I don't know. <coughs> Uh, I was able to install my window um, in the mouth um, and on Rhino, but I was having some issues with Pisa. I was able to use Pisa. I was able to download it and everything was fine. And then when I tried to sign up to it, I went to the program, I get a warning, and I don't know, and then it goes back to the Okay, let's check it in the break. Okay. Um, so rhinoceros, we have also in the academy page a little bit of information, weekly classes, computer aided design. Let's go yesterday class. Two, two, two. Let's go down, 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 down. Where is rice here? So Rhinoceros is a free form design software. It's not compared to Fusion, for example, Fusion is a way more uh, engineering software like Inventor or SolidWorks that are meant to design uh, engineering parts. So usually those kind of softwares uh, kind of avoids a lot of currently made mistakes. For example, when you design a solid object, let's say a rectangle, that object, if you, you might not do it on purpose, but you can easily 
or unexpectedly erase one of the faces. In case of our rectangle, it's really obvious that you are had just erase a face, uh, one of the surfaces. But in case of like free form modeling, you want a lot of alternatives and nothing constraining your modeling. That means it's creating like a lot of organic shapes that might not be solid objects. For example, solid words, inventor, or fusion are mainly for designing uh, what we call possible models for fabrication. It means for making engineering parts. So the engineer parts, the model needs to be perfectly done because later it will be fabricated. Compared to that, uh, Rhino, you can leave a surface not closed because you just want the surface. You will never even want it to fabricate. That means that at the same time that they give you flexibility to design like, uh, like craziness, <laughs> if you want to uh, simplify it, um, that can mm, make you do a lot of mistakes while modeling. Um, at the same time, Rhinoceros is a, as is a free form modeling program, doesn't do, has a lot of power in that aspect, but at the same time has a lot of cons. One of them is like, for example, um, Rhinoceros is not a really good friend of Boolean unions. Boolean unions is, for example, when you take a simple primitive and you add them or you subtract them or you intersect them. With really simple shapes, there is no problem. When we start becoming like really, really complex shapes, uh, my friend, you have a big problem there because your geometry will not subtract. You will need to find alternatives. So, for example, I, some, I, most of times I design engineering parts in Rhino and finally I'm about to finalize the model and things doesn't intersect. So basically what I need to do is export my model to another software, do it there and then import it back again. It's quite annoying at the same time. Uh, you also design objects, but it's, isn't, it's better for surfaces, for freeform surfaces, but you design solid objects too. Um, let's, for example, I will do a clear example. I design a box. I have the box. I will put the view. And this is a closed solid object. This is made out of what? Points, vertices, surfaces, and then the object. That is what it makes the breadth. Actually, this object, these solid objects are called B reps. That is accumulation of surfaces. What happened? I'm doing this in fusion, exploding, and decomposing your solid object. The chat, someone is in the chat. Is there a free license? Uh, right now, we have a free trial lean that is 80 days. It's the best we can give you in the lab. They, we always try to have agreements on to getting licenses, but we never. Actually, for example, I pay my own license. Um, so, for example, I just decompose this B rep into its surfaces. So, right now, I have the independent surfaces that they can easily transform. And right now, instead of having a rectangle, I have five surfaces in the space located. And I can see out of the normal and in the normal. So for example, why I have a face that is purple and why I have a face that is gray? Because the gray has the normal, if I could draw, has the normal pointing outwards. And that's how we know what is inside the space of this rectangle, this box, and what is inside. That's how we know what is contained in the space compared to a fusion. Doing this in fusion is a mess. And basically, you don't do it. Like, you can do it, I think, yes, no? Yeah, but it's not mean to do this kind of things, the software. So at the same time that we can easily do this, and that is a huge benefit because we can create and have, for example, I will show you we have a few examples and then we will go on the um, detail photogrammetry. Yeah. I'm importing right now an OBG, OBJ of this 
is a 3D scan. A 3D scan, you don't have a solid object per se. You what you basically is have to reconstruct a surface. Important or transforming or operating this kind of models inside fusion is basically a mess and it's complicated. It's they're not designed to be the software. So Rhino has the good point of that is a good all-terrain workaround modeling software is it can do meshes can do solids can do engineering parts it's much better for freeform but at the same time that is an all-terrain and all-terrain doesn't go at 300 kilometers per hour <laughs> like uh it's not the best at roads it's not the best at like going on on the cities but works well for everything that's one of the reasons why we use here in most of the computers um another benefit for example you see this is just a single surface that is just created in the space by polygonalization. This is, for example, this is a mesh. If we just put shaded, yeah, we can see here all the triangles of the mesh. Okay, let's go, open a new one, say changes, open in millimeters, yeah, chat, okay, thanks. Um, so another, Extra thing is this software uh, as tries to operate with a lot of different kind of um, formats has huge import options. So actually we can open up files for almost all the softwares and it can do better or worse, but it will do it. That usually most of softwares don't allow these kind of things. For example, Fusion doesn't like to be imported too many external formats. Uh, for example, fusion formats into Rhino, they open up more or less well. Step files usually open up also quite, quite well. Um, but for example, you have a lightweight of MicroStation or Motion Builder that is for creating animations, you can always import it. Um, has a lot of plugins that you can install into Rhino. For example, uh, when you want to jump to CAM, there's something that's called Rhino CAM. That is a extended program it's a plugin that you can install and you can do like machining for CNC's and not only for CNC's, but until five access CNC's onto it. And the capabilities of this program is as good as a standalone program just for CAM machining. So you can have everything in one platform. Uh, the same as we have RhinoCAM, we have plugins for sending to the vinyl cutter, to the laser cutter. Trotec, for example, has a plugin that creates a printer inside RhinoCam, and we just, for sending to the laser cut, we just print the file, as the same as we will do with a 2D printer. Mm -hmm. um, and we have, I will say that is the best thing that we can do, is we have Grasscopper. Grasscopper is a embedded software. It's a software per se, it's not a plugin. It's a program that runs inside Rhino. So Grasscopper is a parametric design tool. A parametric design software is called is for visual scripting. Instead of scripting like a sphere, as you do in OpenSCAD by typing the equation, you have like boxes that contains this part of codes. And basically what you need to do is interconnect them. On next club is on, on Grasscopper. We will do an introduction on Grasscopper. And why Grasscopper runs in Rhino? Because we script here, for example, I will script a sphere, and we have the sphere here, and we have values. Let's display full names, for example, and we can, it's parametric in the way that we have base, what is the base location of the sphere, and what is the radius, and we can do it with values. That's why it's parametric, because it's really easy to change the design. Actually, this fusion does natively. It's already embedded on how the mechanics of fusion and how you model this. In Rhino, it's not native per se. So Grasscopper actually just uses Rhino for opening and closing files and for visualization. So Grasscopper could work on its own, yes, if it takes the core engines of Rhino, but actually it's not in Rhino. The geometry doesn't exist in Rhino, just exists in Grasshopper, and Grasshopper uses Rhino for visualization purposes. 
and inside Grasshopper, then you can install again a lot of plugins. It's inception. You can have a program running in a program running in a program. So, for example, main Grasshopper components are this one, and all the list you see from from this D to the right are different plugins for doing different things. For example, this is a physics engine, like the same as, for example, Cinema 4D, Cinema or Blender. Yesterday, uh, Victor showed you that you can do animations and you can do physics model, modeling. You can also do it here. Might be better or not, but it can do it. Uh, other option will be, for example, KUKA. This is a plugin to actually create files to export to compile like G code is not G code for the KUKA, for example, this one. And we have different ones. And most of these plugins are created by an open source community, and most of the plugins are free and easy to share. So, but let's not get too messy around with Grasshopper. This is not today's class. So, Rhino interface. Rhino interface. Uh, do you see something similar to this right now in your computers? More or less, no? Okay. You all see the command line. No, this command, it should be maybe it's on top, sometimes it's on the bottom. Oh my god, I just messed up my screen. Yeah, here. Actually put it on top. It's important the command line because it will show us references. Uh, the ones that are familiar with 3D modeling, I see that someone here already has created something. <laughs> Uh, here, uh, the modeling software always asks you for extra things. For example, let's say we want to create a rectangle. A way to create a rectangle could be by going. What is a rectangle? It's a core. It's a core type of curve that is standard, and we have on the left all the options of primitives. Here, for example, we have a rectangle. All the programs. Model, or most of the modeling programs have shortcuts. That means you can create the same command instead of doing it by the GUI, the graphical user interface, you can create it by a command line. So in Rhinoceros, we have it on the top and it's showing us what is the status. So when you're started, I will recommend to open up a little bit this menu. So let's say we want to create a rectangle. We can either go to tab of curve or surface and select rectangle and click and drag to create the rectangle. You can do the same by just typing rec. And it will make an auto suggestion menu. So you can go and everything that has more or less that letter combination will be shown. Not always everything, but because sometimes if you put R, there are endless things with R. So it shows you a few things. Rectangle. And before clicking on the screen, you can see that it's asking, it's asking us things. What, for example, it's basically telling us what to do or how to do it. So it's first corner of rectangle. You want to make a, the first corner, I want to do it here, for example. Or you can actually choose the location in the space. You can type it free form in the space, like randomly located. Or I can type, for example, in the point zero, comma, zero, comma, zero. And I will click enter. That will locate the first point of my rectangle in the origin of the workspace. And then it's asking, okay, the other corner or length. So actually it's asking me where is the other point. So I here I can could type different things, for example. 2020, 20, that is basically the size in X, ooh, or and Y, or 2050, or 200, for example, enter, and then do it with the width. I can do it separately with and height, or both at the same time. So it's 200 by 500, for example. And I have my rectangle. So inside each command, you have a lot of subcommands. Again, for example, it type freeform the rectangle, and then I can type 0, 0, 0, and lock it to 0, 0, 0. Or either I can say, I want three points to locate 
my rectangle. I want this point, then this point, and I have located. You can state one location for the width and one location for the edge. So inside each command, you have subcommands that allows you to do different kinds of transformations. Inside uh, rhinoceros, rhinoceros right now, you see my screen split it up by four different visualizations. We have the top that I can zoom in, the perspective, the front, and one of the sides. Um, personally, because I mostly don't use Rhino, I use Grasshopper, I only use one of the visualizations, but that depends on your completely work style. So let's say you want to change to a full screen mode that you don't have the, split, the screen split. You can just double click in one of the names. So double click in perspective will make it full screen. What happens if you want to go back again? You can double click and it will come back. So uh, inside each visualization window, we can choose different visualization aspects. For it, we first need to create a solid object because with just with wire and like lines, we don't can we don't see really differently things. So let's create a box. You can just type box and create a box, whatever shape, really doesn't matter. And you see right now that the box is in wireframe aesthetics. Depends on your background or depends on basically personal values. You can choose how to visualize it with like a solid object as a wireframe or maybe you like render. So you see that there is a little tab next to the visualization window on perspective, I'll choose perspective and click on it. And you see a big menu shows up. It's divided in different parts. First is visualization types. So from wireframe, shaded, rendered, ghosted, x-ray, technical, artistic, pen, arctic, ray traced, there are different kinds of visualizations. So sometimes uh, you are making an object inside an object, you can work in render because you are not able to see what is happening inside. You need to set up ghosted. Let's go over each one. So we have shaded. Okay, basically shows me and kind of renders a little bit a surface, kind of in a, with some kind of studio light. It's not the best one, it's not a render per se, but is to give a little bit of three-dimensionality. It's not a flat color. We have rendered, that is a main render engine that runs inside Rhino. Uh, I have Rhino 7, so the render and ray trace will be slightly different for you. You don't have Rhino 7. Like they made a big improvement in the render engine of Rhino in Rhino 7. We have ghosted, that is, like shaded, but a little bit see-through, like 70% opacity. We have X-ray, that is sim really similar to ghosted. We have technical, for creating technical drawings where the lines are discontinuous, the ones that are hidden. We have artistic, like drawing in paper and with shadows. We have pen, similar to shaded, but without like the fake paper on the screen. We have Arctic, really, really nowadays, is this mode just came from Rhino 6, was new in Rhino 6, and it's widely used for making render styles because it renders really fast, doesn't slow down your model, and more or less looks nice. Most of our designer architects is like a flat white color style. Architects hmm? Architects, yeah. And then we have ray trace that you see that is like rendering in life. It's called re life rendering. For example, Lumion, Lumion program is a program that is for rendering and making animation and video animations does life rendering. This obviously is way slower and you see that actually it's previewing with grains because it's not, has not preloaded and it's slowly rendering on life. The rendering quality in life is lower but it's good if you are all the time changing the texture and colors and you want to see more or less the final aesthetics without having actually to explore the final rendering. This mode is just new from Rhino 7 also too. 
And then we have uh, more options. We have the pan tool and rotate options that will be the ones that we can do with the right click of the mouse, center click and drag, zoom in, zoom out. We have set view. For example, this menu that is set view is we can choose that this top right window doesn't show the perspective. For example, shows the isometric northeast. So we can change actually what is showing each one of the windows. So for example, right now I'm modeling in isometric in this view instead of a perspective view. We can also choose, for example, set view to right. Maybe I, I want to have two visualization windows, one in Arctic or render and one in wireframe. Can we also change the visualization styles on the other windows? Yes. Just go over it and let's change, for example, this to uh, artistic. So we have, for example, artistic, pen. So we can actually visualize things from different views and in different locations. In general, if you ask me, I always state shaded and set the view to perspective and just go full screen. I simplify a little bit things. I find easier to model at full screen. Uh, when you have the menu open and full screen, you can always change from the different four views on the bottom left corner. You have top, front, and you can change from the different views at full screen. The same views that you have when you double click on the menu. Let me think a little bit of one. Then we have, what else we have? We have the traditional open file, save file, save small. It's like save for the web. It's a kind of compressed way. Uh, we can save a file as a template. We can import or export selected. We can export, for example, when we have a file and we have different objects, let's say we have all these boxes. Let's say we don't want to save everything because that is commonly done uh, for 3D modeling. You are making different mockups and you only want to print one object in the printer. So you don't want to save everything and you don't want to erase and save everything. So you just select one of the objects you want to actually export and you say export selected and you will only export that one. Uh, we have properties of the file, like edit, arrange, solid modeling, mesh modeling, dimensions for making annotations, transformation tools, tools, analyze, render. I have, for example, here the plugin that I installed. I have RhinoCam here. So what else we have? RhinoCeros works in a way that we have the commands on top. Thank you the commands on top and we have a lot of different tabs that are grouped by families so for example we have the standard that it will be most used commands and you see that we have top menu and left menu right now this is on my left but you can drag it and relocate it wherever you want and now it doesn't relocate you who Oh my God, ¿en serio? No se va a quedar. So toolbar, let's say, uh, edit button. Come on. Okay, it's not showing up. Yuhu. View. Mm. What is this? For example, I just messed up my Rhino. So where to look and change things? Uh, if you go to view, for example, you can go to uh, display options. You go to view, display options. You can here go to the settings of Rhino setups. And here we can find, for example, document properties. I have that 
every time I create a file, puts my name, etc. I usually use, for example, millimeters and I use large scale objects, documents of the users, hatch type, line types, location, for example, is located in Seattle, always my Rhino files, really important. <laughs> we had advanced properties that are something that usually don't play a lot. You can put Rhino scripts, you can embed like C sharp scripts in the Rhino zeros. But I will say that we have the most interesting part that is display modes. Here we can have a view of the different display modes. And that's important because it's here we, where we can uh, customize them. For example, let's change to pen. Pen right now has this line width, this line weight. I want to change the line weight. So for example, let's change line weight, altitude, pen, shading edge effects. Or is artistic the one that we can change the line with? Yeah. So for example, we go we change from in shading effects from a standard shading to parallel lines. And here we can see, for example, change the shading effects. For example, instead of two, let's state like uh, 20. Let's see if we see the difference. Not too much. Let's change it again. Not face transparency. Or we can change the transparency 50%. Dime. No, tío, acabo de hacer la lista elementary y faltan más de cosas. Estarán arriba, supongo. Mm. Okay, let's change. So here is where we can actually change also, for example, the color of the background. Instead of having a white, we can have a red. Uh, that's important if, for example, uh, you're colorblind. You want to change the color scheme of your computer. Um, I think that Rhino Zeros also embeds a full colorblind mode that you can change the full interface colors. I don't know what it is, but one student last year had needed to change it. And that's important because why? One of the first things that I strongly recommend to do always in Rhinoceros is to make your own custom visualization space. Why? Right now, I mean shaded is the most standard visualization mode. If you explode this, I just explode my box. Okay. I will erase this surface, one of the surface. I just explode and take one of the surface. I see that this book has five surfaces, but I don't see visually if the normals are correct, correctly oriented or not. Why? Because all the surfaces have the same color. The front and back face have the same color. So my recommendation is to create your own display mode. For example, I have one that I just call so simple. Best setting. <laughs> I have minimalist change, just that the back face of the surface, the one that doesn't have the normal, is in a different color. And I put purple because I, ne I hate purple and I never draw in purple. So I just choose the color that I will never use. So how we create one menu? For example, we go to display. And what you can do is display mode, select one of them. For example, we can just choose shaded and we create a copy. Copy of shaded. Let's put the name. This is a test. OK, I want to use the background is the application setting. Let's say this greyish gray color. Or for example, you can use your own custom color. Uh, a lot of people like to work in dark if they, you have work in previous kind of visualization modes and you have been modeling for a lot of years. So let's go. This is a test. We'll do it again. So we can go to view display options or we can also take it from here. Display options. 
you see that we have display modes. I just go to the list, select one of them, and on the bottom, you have the copy. Okay, so I will now go to the mode and I will start customizing my things. Usually, I'm a little bit silly, but I like to work in white. Go custom plane. You can use render settings to have a, like a fake plane or not. Uh, you can show shades in the ground plane or not. You can kind of mix and have like a visualization between render and shaded or semi-render. You can input the gamma. Uh, we can show only a few things. For example, maybe it's a visualization mode that we want to export files or making screenshots that look nice. So for example, we can choose to not show points. A point usually is like a dot in the middle of the space and you just want to show geometries. So you can choose to not show points. For example, never show me points, never show me text, never show me annotations. You can customize different options of the program. Uh, lighting scheme, for example, you can choose a scene lighting. The fall lightings, you can choose kind of ambient occlusion to this kind of render, and you can enhance to have the GPU on or not. So it takes more or less resources. So I will say no lighting. And the most important parameter here is the opposite color of the surface, no? To actually change the background of the surface. That will be, for example, back face settings. So you can cool back faces, you can single object for all back faces, uh, or a rendering material. For example, you can put that it looks shows like cow skin, like the back faces. I recommend it because it will slow down your computer but single color for all back faces. In this case, I will choose purple as I stated before. Okay, and now I have the color of the back face changes. Confirm, and this is a good standard workaround for rhinoceros to just change and have the revisalization of the surface and the opposite. So we actually take the, the bad thing of a free modeling software and help it help to not commit my too so many mistakes by changing a little bit the visualizations. What else we have? For example, we have the right menu that is in general is properties of the window. For example, we can see what, what is the location of the camera because we can take a screenshots and make a snapshots of where the location of the camera is. So here we see the location of the camera in the space. We can change the focal length if you know a little bit of camera, you have wide angle cameras and you have long uh, angle cameras, like short angle cameras. So here we can change. Humans, more or less, is a convention we see at 50 millimeters standard of photography. That is, or wide angle, that is actually humans. We have a field of view 160 something degrees, but how we see the things that form three dimensionally is more or less equivalent photography to a 50 millimeters. So that's why the program is in 50 millimeters. For example, phones, usually the picture that you see in the phone has different perspective than the one that you use in a reflex camera. So for example, phones have usually 30 degrees. And you see that the image just came back. It will be like taking out the zoom if you have a photographic lens. But that means when you get close, things are getting more and more deformed, no? Humans, when we get close to an object, it doesn't get to the form and how we see a box. For example, if we have a camera lens of 10, that will be kind of GoPro. You see that things are getting really deformed. Sometimes you want to change the camera lens because you have a model that is really small or it is really big and you want to have more control over how you move around the program. In general, uh, most of the standard is to have a 50 millimeter standard camera lens but for example i modeling i usually i'm changing all the time the camera lens to make it easier to move around the model it's something that is easy to, to change we have the layer menu that will be exactly the same as you have in autocad 
Illustrator or Photoshop, GIMP, Inkscape, all the programs. So we can, we are always in a certain layer that is ticked with this small tick. If you double click on a layer, it will change that layer. And now that I'm in that layer, for example, if I make a box, the box, you see that now the things are in green. Why? Because the layer color is green. So my object is green. I can change to a layer purple and the object will be purple. What else we can choose? We can choose actually to lock a layer. That means that we cannot grab the object and we cannot erase it. It means something that you want that is there, but we don't want to operate on it. We can also show to hide the layer. In case something is bothering us, we can always hide that one. We can change the color of the visualization of the layer. We can associate a material to the layer. That means, for example, all the objects that are in layer green, when I change to display render mode, I can choose, for example, to be, uh, I don't know, plastic, plastic, fantastic, uh, orange, semi-transparent color. Okay, so now, for example, I have associated a certain materiality to my box that I'm not looking at it right now. But if I change to render or ray trace, it was not showing why, because I'm below the Z zero. I'm on the other side of the ground plane. This mode has ground plane. So if the ground plane, I'm the camera is below zero, I will not be able to see anything. I'm behind the, the digital earth. So right now, for example, I have a material that is plastic. If I change, for example, purple, that is the box that is just behind, I can choose to be metal. Uh, where is metal? Metal, let's take a really silver one. And these are really simple textures of rendering. Let's move this one here. For example. So for example, I see a, a kind of plastic transparent box on a, a metal box rendered, for example. Render is a simplified rendering view. Uh, the setting. Okay, what else? We have the line type. In case you are working just with lines, for example, line. I just I'm just typing line. I want to make a line like this. That the line is. Uh, sorry, let's go to layer three. It's dot line. And now it's not displaying as dots. Why? Because the dots need scale. We need to change the scale of the line to actually check that thing. No borres las fotos que hay dentro, por favor. Oh. And we have the print view that is the display mode that you are able to see when you have a print format. We can create new layers, we can copy new layers, we can move them up or down, we can put filters, tool. What else we have? We have rendering. By defect, if you are, for example, let's just take this mode. If you are in render, this is a render engine that is inside Rhinoceros. And we have the dimensions of the export of the render. I will put a really small format so it doesn't take a lot. The quality of the render, the space. Uh, let's choose a 360 environment, a studio environment. Studio, 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 and I will click in render. And the render option will show up and actually it's a start, just start to render the model in the position that I was in. And 
as you see right now, I just set up the most random values. So this is the super render that we just made. And we can save the format in, save the render in JPEG, or in this case, I would recommend to save it in TIFF or PNG, because it will save each color in a different visualization layer. We have the RGB in three different layers. So if you go then to Photoshop or to GIMP, you can edit each one individually to adjust the render. We can also adjust the render here. Yes, I didn't know about it. <laughs> really? Yeah, I don't know. Okay. I, I'm not sure if it was in, well, I, I haven't used Rhino to render because it used to be very bad. Yes, it used to be very bad. Rhino 7 has way a lot of improvements in the render engine. Haven't tried that much, but. Yes, I guess. Um, but I don't know if it was something of D ray or confusion in that you, you were able hmm. to see that to, to get a render. Uh, never, I don't know. I will look for it. I'm interested. Okay. Uh, what was the question? That if, if we have a mute to make a like 360 render of the workspace and then choose the where the camera lo is located. So basically, it renders the whole workspace of your object. It's kind of what similar what Lumion does, that is actually live rendering everything and you can actually navigate through like a video game. Uh, GS state, for example, yes, we have plugins for render inside Rhino that you can install. That the most famous one is, is Keyshot. Uh, Keyshot is a really popular for objects for industrial design because it has a lot, lot of naturality in the materials for the small materials. And for larger objects, we usually use like V Ray that is widely used in architecture. Keyshot gets like amazing product, yes. Way different and they don't want to try that right now. Exactly. They don't have <laughs> um, what else we have? Uh, materials. Here, for example, we have the setting the material libraries. And we can just use one or create our own materials by importing bump maps, bitmaps, and have different properties. Then we have the desktop, and we are missing here. Okay. In the main, in properties, that's something that is really interesting is sometimes we are navigating and we get lost. And especially if you want to make a screenshot and you always want to do it from the same location, you will not never reach exactly the same location. So we have here that is a snapshot that is save frame. We save the frame and we'll actually save this camera location. We have options for this. And actually, this is in panels, uh, snapshots. Yes, here is where we can open up new windows to add to these tabs. For example, we have snapshots. We just, I just drag it to here, and I will say, OK, save this. Save a snapshot one. And I want to save this snapshot and which, with which properties I can save all the position of the objects. So I can not only save the snapshot, but also the like freeze that instant. So I always can come with the camera back to this position. People is chanting in the chat and oh, display option. <laughs> like long time ago, I think. Um, we have the materials, the camera, the display mode that we have choose. So also, for example, if right now we want to save this in render and every time we come to this position of the camera shows always in render, we can just save it. So for example, I will save this and I will save, this is save frame, just take it out. Uh, I will save this mode in Arctic and I save again. Save and I want to save the display mode. And then I want to change this one and say to ray trace or like this. And Snapshot three, save. Okay, so now when I jump double click, I will jump through the different workspace. And you see that the first one is not changing actually the display mode because I didn't change that property in. 
these are like utilities of rhinoceros that depends on what you do is might be useful or not um what else we have let's hide this uh we have the osnap and the different settings something that is really really important especially here for these six months is that you try to work always in millimeters why in fabrication everything is in millimeters unless you are in the states or uh, like imperial country that everything will be in inches but we always try to use like more or less logic units so millimeters if you are not don't know if you are not completely sure you can see here see here what is the workspace of your model so you double click on it double click right click sorry unit settings and then you can change the model units and what is the absolute tolerance the decimals etc we strongly recommend to always check this like you can see how many times students like send a file to the laser cut and it's like 10 times smaller 10 times bigger or doesn't fit in the machine because it measures like one kilometer uh you could not believe that what else we have we have this that is grid snap yeah a template file exactly so does it impact a lot or that choose actually the units of your model okay. so you have like centimeter inches millimeter like we'll show it on the screen so you have open open a new sorry it's not open it's file new no don't save the changes and we have all this so you have feet inches etc so whatever you choose choose millimeters you can choose large objects or small objects what is the difference between those workspace it's actually a little bit of the display options for example if i choose large objects you see this plane this is a reference plane is huge because it's for a large object if in the for example if i draw a box of one one box uh, zero one 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 oh sorry one this is my box you see the scale of the grid meanwhile if i if you choose a model in small objects millimeters and you do a box in zero one 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 you see this difference the scale the scale of the grid of the initial grid one is like uh, one thousand and the other one is one because one even if you work in millimeters you can be having like let's say a 3d scan of a terrain of a house or you can be the using for design a bolt or a nut actually in my personal opinion really doesn't make a big change it's just a little bit on visualizations and you can always change that scale later on um what else we have we have ortho that if you want to make for example a line line I will clip the start of the line here. You see that right now I can only attach to what is exactly parallel to Y. How I know this green is Y? Because I can see it here in this left down corner, that is the axis location. You can only go parallel to the X and Y. A tip that right now we are working in a plane, we are working in the plane X, Y. But this is a 3D space. How we cannot move to, to Z? This is a little bit of interactivity of how Rhino works. That is, you work in planes. You work in X, Y plane, or you work in Y, Z plane, or you work in X, Z plane. So you can change in which axis you are working with. And how we can change this, let's say we want to make a point, and now we want to make a straight line in the vertical. There are two different ways. One is change the plane location, and we can do this meanwhile we have a command. For example, right now I'm in the middle of a command we are, we are making a line. You can see here the tab planes has different options. Set a plane, set a plane elevation, set a plane based on an object. So we can make a custom plane a certain degrees. But here we have the easy one. Let's say front plane, 
standard plane with an Z reversed, or for example, war plane front. I just change my plane, my, my plane to a Z X plane. I was in X Y. Now I'm in Z X Z plane. So now my line is vertical, is in parallel to the Z. And then I can go back and my line will be still there. So basically that's allowed you to always change work in one of the plane directions and to be steady in that direction. Another option is if you don't want to be changing planes all the time, that sometimes is a little bit annoying, you can just make a line, for example, and you see that I can only go, we can only go in X and Y. You can hold shift, sorry, I was, I never think about this command, I do it naturally. Um, you can hold Alt key, I'm holding Alt key and I'm pressing in the initial point. Uh, wait, sorry, it was, is control, not Alt. <laughs> so I have the line, you hold control and I will make the point in the same location. And now I can change in to do the line completely perpendicular. Let's say when you think in control and you click again in the origin of the location, you can take the normal of the plane. It's an, a way to overwrite directly. What I was explaining is ortho. Ortho only allow us to go on the parallel of the axis of the plane that we are working with. Let's make a line. And right now, how we can, let's say I want to make a line at 45 degrees angle or randomly in the space. I can unselect ortho mode that the right now is in bluish. And now I can be freely move my point, my line all around the X and Y workspace. And again, they doing custom. So for example, I can take this one. You see that if you are a little bit used to some modeling programs, we have something that is like, try to go can kind of have a magnetic snap to another point location. For example, I want that this point finish in this line. Right now, this is not activated. There is no magnetic help of the program. That is called OSNAP. OSNAP is actually, you see when I get close, is autom automatically getting close or giving me a guide line. That is the OSNAP. And the OSNAP, we can have guidelines for a lot of different things. Those guidelines are all these click menus on the bottom. So for example, I have guidelines for everything. And this is completely personal. Uh, some people, they don't like that the line grabs on every point. For example, I have near. A lot of people doesn't have near. So if I have the point, it's grabbing to the nearest point. I can do it here. For example, I have also midpoint. So when I get to the middle of the line, it will go and hover and oop, I know that this is exactly the midline. Or this is exactly the end in and or not at the same time. Or we can choose to do a perpendicular. Really depends. For example, or I have the something that a lot of people don't like, that is the apparel intersection. This is an apparent intersection, but if I click, for example, is the apparent intersection from that perspective. Let's say I want to make another line from here to this line, and you see now it's suggesting me in this point, if you click now, you will have the perpendicular. Okay. Right now we are creating this kind of structure. What happened when you want to create with units? For example, the start of the line. And I want that this line is exactly, I don't know, 20 millimeters. I just type the number and this is constraining the total length of my line to a 20 millimeters line. Also, we have the smart track that is kind of another help. And we have the gumball. Gumball is something that is not in every 3D modeling software but for example, Fusion has it, and actually in Fusion is how you work with, um, that is this. When you select an object, 
this menu shows up. And this is a three-dimensional moving edit rotational uh, help. And also for a scale. That means, for example, we want to move this line on the X 10 centimeters. You can either do it by taking the red arrow and dragging, doing it in a free way, or you can do it by in a great way by clicking on the red arrow and typing 10. And it will move exactly to that location. Another one will be, for example, to rotate. I want to rotate on the X, Y, and on the Z axis, 45 degrees. So I just rotate it. And you can rotate three-dimensionally in all the axes. You see that my gumball has changed, no? No. It's not before. Here, right now, is completely parallel to the axis of the program. If I rotate 45 degrees and I don't unselect it, it will now be rotated also the gumball 45 degrees. If you unselect the line and select it again, it will take a new reference for the gumball. That will be the world origin. It's important to always see that difference. For example, if I rotate something, the gumball also rotates with it. And I, now I can move with this new gumball orientation. Meanwhile, if I'm unselect and selected, the gumball gets reset. We also have this red and green that right now is for a scale. We can scale in one of the directions. Something that is important of the gumball is, for example, rotations and everything are always done in the midpoint of your geometry. So for example, I'm going to create a polygon or let's create a polyline, polyline. I want to close the polyline. I have this weird shape. The Goombal is, not, is oriented exactly in the centroid of the geometry, whatever if it's a 2D or if it's a 3D. For example, if we extrude this curve, Uh, best setting right now, I just extrude this curve. Now I can take my geometry and orient it in a lot of different locations. Or we can also, what is this rep made out of? What is this rep made out of? Surfaces, no? We can manually transform an individual surface how I can only select one of the surface of the bread object. You hold control, shift, and click, for example, on this face. I have selected the surface that construct this bread without actually separating from the bread. So now, for example, I can transform the bread and everything it will modify. That's why this program is called Freeform Modeling Program, because it will automatically adapt and create this freeform surface based on your transformation. I will repeat it. We have this model, and I want that this surface, for example, is rotated or just a little bit higher. And I don't want to care about how the rest of the shape deforms. This doesn't work. 99.9% of times, depends on the geometry that you are working with. This is a simple geometry, but it works well. For example, let's say now that this surface is a kind of a lofted surface, I want to, for example, scale it down. I want to scale and make it smaller. I can start transforming my geometry. How we select a face? Whatever is a face or a point, we always do it with control, shift, and then click. And for example, if I do it in the edge, I can select only the edge. We can select the units that compose that geometry. Uh, it will be uh, command shift, I think. 
Yes, no? Yeah, every all the control commands in Rhino in, are in it command, like command key. So now we can choose, for example, to create this geometry. Okay, disable high fleeting controls. You have, there is a really, really, really huge particularity that I think that is one of the strongest points of Rhino. That is when we construct things, I just created this line. Uh, you want to build a 3D model out of it. How we do it? We can patch the surface and extrude the surface, or we can extrude the, the curve into a, a box, no? So for example, we can extrude the curve. I just created the solid object, and here in the menu, we can see we want to extrude to both sides, both sides, or no, or we can make it solid or not. For example, it can cap the curve to make it a solid object or not. We click and you see that the curve is still selected. Why? When we have transformation tools of this point in Rhino, we have, for example, we have a two points and we create a line between the points. The point don't, doesn't disappear and gets transformed into the line. We are creating a line based on the points. Happens the same with this. We created a solid object based on a curve, but the curve doesn't disappear, doesn't get embedded into the model. So actually I can, I have created the object and can move back and I still have my original curve. That's important, for example, if you are working with a little bit of engineering 2D plans. Let's say I have the size of a wheel Mm -hmm. I have this. This is a bearing. For example, I have the plan of a bearing. This kind of mechanical elements. And I have imported the JPEG and I have scaled it down to the real dimensions, for example. And I'm copying the image and making the 3D model out of it. So, for example, I can extrude these two and now extrude uh, this one. I don't know, I don't care, this is really random. And I want to make an union. Union, Boolean union. So this is one object. What happened? If the original curves have disappeared, I will have to erase this and now extrude the center, create again the circle and extrude it. But because they don't disappear, I can constantly be using the original curves all the time. So I can subtract this. And if I move my objects, I can still use them for creating a new bearing or make a small modification. So at the same time, it's bad if you are not a really organized person because you forget that you have lines laying around but it's really strong because it's not erasing. It's like having a manual history of what you are doing. This is especially with curves for extruding, extruding surfaces or extruding curves, etc. So for example, let's say we have this surface. Uh, I don't know. Um, we can cap this. Object to caps. Cap. Uh, surface. Planar surface. Okay. I just created a surface from the original circle, but the circle is still there. So we are building and building on top of previous geometry without actually erasing them. What else? What else? What else? <laughs> yes. So you say you're in a perspective view. And there's a that's Thank you. You just remind me to explain the last part that is what you actually will use next week. That is quite important for the laser cut. As you said, we have this 3D object. And right now, let's say I want to 
engrave it in a piece of wood, whatever. I want to make this 3D object flat, just lines. How we can do that? There is a command that is called make 2D. And we select the objects that we want to make 2D. Okay. And it give, this menu shows up. It means you want to make it 2D from which direction? You need to take the account that is basically taking a snapshot of the view, add, flatten it, compress it, and making it just with vectors. So for example, we can make a 2D from this perspective, and we can show to not show the hidden lines, not show tangent objects, etc. So we can, for example, make a 2D, and you have seen that this just appeared. This basically is the view, the 2D view of the object in this location. What happened if, for example, we want to make the, the top view of this? We want to have the perfect circles that we want to transform it back. We can select it and say make 2D, but we want to do it from the top. So if you do it from the top, now we have again or lines, the original lines that we have used to create this. It's important when you make this command that you do a few key commands. We have like three or four key commands that we always do, especially for CNC or laser cut is for fabrication. And we will go we will go over again next week and next in coming weeks, but you see that when I select this, I'm not selecting individual lines. When you don't know what this is happening, always go to properties. This will tell you what kind of object you have selected. For example, I choose this one and it's saying, okay, you have a closed polysurface. If you have a mesh, it will tell you this is a closed mesh. It means it's a good mesh or if it's an open mesh. For example, a 3D scan is an open mesh. You cannot 3D print it. You can only 3D print closed meshes. We have this surface. Okay, this is a trimmed surface. It's just a surface. It's not a solid object per se. We have this one that is also a closed extrusion. That is a breadth. What is this? Ooh, three closed curves grouped. The same as yesterday, Neil explained with Inkscape, we can group and block objects. There are two different things. One is blocks and one is making uh, groups. Groups is making like relative items one to each other so you when you grab one you can group, move the whole amount how we do this is the commands are most of times are really logical if you want to ungroup the command is ungroup okay so now you see in the type it has changed from three closed curves group to just three closed curves even so that we have this, or for example, this is the make 2D that we did before, is 25 open curves grouped. Let's ungroup them. Okay, that's good. But you see that, wow, as the perspective view is creating new geometries, ideally, this line and this line, for example, could be together, no? They will, this could be one curve, unique curve. How we can do it to fix this? We can just click join to join these two different curves. And let's say I want to join also this, this, and this, and this, and this to have a closed shape. So I join them. Let's say you just messed up and you didn't want to do this. You can always Break, it, break them down, that is explode. That will explode the lines into the original trimmed curves. There is one last command that is really important for laser cut and CNC. That is something that happens when you made a mistake. For example, let's say you have, you have this line and you just copy it on the same location. You don't see that you have two lines, but actually there are two lines there. This in 2D modeling is just a 
dirty 3D model, but there is no big issue. But in case of the laser cut, the laser cut will go twice over that curve. It will cut these two curves. In case of the CNC, it will happen the same. How we can solve that? When you select the curve, you see this shows up. It's a selection menu. This selection menu only opens up when the program doesn't know exactly what you are selecting. In this case, it's quite obvious. There is two curves, one on top of each other, and it doesn't know which one you want to select. So you can choose one of them or none. And you can erase it, delete. OK. Another option is use a command that is made out of for cleaning. That is cell dupe. As the command states, is select duplicate. For that, you need to select everything that you are want to check. Select duplicates, no duplicates found. And as you see, sometimes the command doesn't work. <laughs> Always, like proof of concept. That's weird because it's even the same curve spot. Slice three D models, yes. Slice. Uh, it's a slice, I think. A slice. No, is. You can do it by streaming with another surface, in an array, or slice it. I don't remember. If I, I don't uh, of the that Objects for contour, oh, contour, contour yeah. place plane is going to take the XY base plane, or let's take, for example, the base plane, or let's take this one, and, or let's, yeah. well, there are better softwares for that. We'll show you next week one that is called Slicer, that is embedded into Fusion. Oh, okay. That is specific for that, and otherwise, a lot of mistakes that Rhino creates. Uh, what else? I think we just went a little bit over the basic, basic things of hovering and modeling with Rhino zeros. You have any questions? Yeah. How can you align uh, the surface of an object so that it becomes parallel with the curve? Or Sorry, could you repeat again? Imagine you have two objects uh, like this, and you want to align this object to the other one. Like this. Okay. So depends on your uh, what you are creating. For example, the question is how we create create a reference model based on another like non-uniform plane. Yeah. So, for example, let's say we have made this three-dimensional rotation. No is not oriented in any standard plane. So the easiest way here is to create the point, the plane based on the surface. So we select three points and they will create the plane automatically based on that orientation. So if we create a box, the box will be located with the same orientation as the plane that you just created. And we can always come back to the original one. Another option will be if you are creating, for example, this box object that is this is a little bit more is a little more annoying, but is you can introduce a rotate or you rotate 3D. That means you can create your own what you want to create, rotate. And you can create your own three-dimensional axis of rotation to rotate on respect of that. Uh, but that will automatically, you will need to rotate at least two times on different axes. It's a little bit more annoying. Uh, it might exist a command that is faster. I know that in Grasshopper it exists, that is aligned plane faces that ultimately makes a transformation rot uh, rotation. And right now, I'm not that sure. Is that about all the constraints between surfaces and curves and you said that you think are parallel? Sorry? What we was asking is also about giving constraints to your model. 
when you're drawing two square box and you want them to be parallel, there is another way of doing that than what you've shown, or not to give constraints to your drawing? Oh, no, not in Rhino. Yes, in Fusion. Okay. <laughs> that is, that is, you use SolidWorks, no? Uh, some other software, but yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. The fusion does that. Okay. Right now, no. As far as I know, no. Okay. I have to also be honest. Like I feel more, way more comfortable in Grasshopper than Rhino. Like I most of the times I use Rhino for just for the Grasshopper. Ah, maybe with Grasshopper we can do that. With Grasshopper is easy. Okay. Because we can always reference constraints all over the scripts. Okay. For example, uh, uh, I can show you. This model, I will show you on the camera. Uh, this model is completely freeform, but everything is related to each other. So whatever I change here, everything adapts. So it's a full parametric model that is a kind of constraint. Constraint that then is a param is parametrization of 3D models. So it can be done with if it's in inside brain, no, inside Grasshopper, yes. So for example, if I change the inner hole of this instead of eight millimeters to six, everything shrinks down like adapts and change the location of the places because we have rela relative make things relative okay. to each other this like he's not native in rhino by the fact yeah Depends on the format that you export. Depends completely on the format that you export. Uh, in that case, uh, I don't think that we have fusion directly here, no? A step, no? A step. Like, it's a step is the general workaround for, for sharing these things. It's so far so good is the best, one of the best ones. Unless you work with, for example, uh, point cloud depends on what you're doing for example if you have a 3d scan that it will be a point cloud you will save imply that is a standard flow point cloud object um obj if it's a mesh obj for sure like whatever if it's a mesh you need to save like in the format for the mesh you can say for example this is not a mesh can we save to an obj yes what will happen it's a mesh file format that will make a transformation from our nerves to our mesh. So, for example, if I save this as um, we need to make a freeform surface so you can actually see. Mm -hmm. Okay, more or less. This is the object. I will save it as a STL or OBJ. It really doesn't matter. STL test save. Okay. And you see, it's asking me it's asking me why let's sorry i i used to do this kind of things without thinking so sometimes i forget so save to it's asking tolerance resolution what is this it's like how accurate you need your matrix of polygonization to be how small you want to have large triangles accurate to zero zero one millimeters or really huge and big accurate to one millimeter so the maximum triangulation size is one millimeter, or in this case is zero, zero, one. A smaller triangulation means more detailed objects, a more accurate mesh, but also that means a way more, uh, it's a more weight, sorry, it's a bigger file, basically. So for example, you can have a defined mesh, the mesh of this is 30 megabytes. For example, at Z resolution, at one is not even like one megabyte. It's 30 times bigger. You can always preview that will show you, for example, how it will triangulate your object. You can make it smaller and slowly will increase the edge count. Depends on the surface, it will not increase the edge count because we it can consider that with those edge counts and this polygonization, the model is exactly accurate to the 3D model as it is. We also have, in case of STL, binary or ASCII encoding. For STL, we always recommend to use ASCII binary encoding. We export it. And you see my model is still a surface, but if I drop it in and I import it, 
it's asking me what is the import options. And I have the same model, but polygonization because I have saved in a mesh file format. It's important when you choose the file format to know what kind of geometries you are working with. You have any more question? So far, so good. Okay, uh, let's have like five, 10 minutes break and then just jump to fusion, okay? Everything well in the cloud? Yeah, thank okay. you.